Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We are recording today from various locations around Winnipeg, all of which are located in Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota, as well as the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heart of the Métis homeland. Our drinking water comes from Shoal Lake 41st Nation in Treaty 3 territory. In this episode, we will be discussing The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. I'm Dennis, from a planet in the vicinity of Alpha Proxima and not the idea mill as I've often led people to believe. Across the screen from me is... Hi, I'm Kirsten, your hoopy frood from Harvey Smith Library, currently docked at St. James Library for the moment. I'll see where the infinite improbability drive takes me next. And across the screen from me is... Hi, I'm Trevor, and I'm coming to you from the friendly confines of the Louis Riel Library. You'll have to excuse me, I've just put my Babel fish in my ear, so I hope <laughs> I can finally understand what you two jokers are talking about. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> A good book can carry me away from an ever-engined Dear readers, we couldn't do this without you. Your questions and comments are the electronic thumb that let us hitch a ride on the spaceship of the imagination. You can find our email address and all of our social media outlets by going to wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca and scrolling to the bottom of the page. Be sure to stick around for our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. In a minute, Trevor is going to summarize this month's book. But first, Kirsten will give us a bio of the author. Douglas Noel Adams, or DNA, was born 1952 in Cambridge, England, and he likes to point out that DNA was actually born earlier than the discovery of the structure of DNA at the University of Cambridge in 1953. So uh, his parents uh, divorced when he was four, and his mother, Susan, moved their family, him and his sister, to an RS. PCA animal shelter in Essex run by his maternal grandparents. And this would have a huge influence on him and he would become a lifelong advocate for animals and the environment. Douglas Adams was six feet tall by the age of 12. He would eventually reach six foot five. And along with his height, he was very well known at school for his ability to write stories. In 2014, a poem he wrote in 1970 at the age of 17 was discovered in a cupboard at the Brentwood School that he attended, and the poem was entitled, A Dissertation on the Task of Writing a Poem on a Candle and an Account of Some of the Difficulties Thereto Pertaining. <laughs> he received entrance to attend the St. John's College in Cambridge on the strength of a essay on religious poetry that discussed the Beatles and William Blake. After leaving university, he really wanted to work in television and radio as a writer, and he wrote for the BBC, for Monty Python, and other sketches, but it definitely was not easy. He didn't have immediate success. He had to do a lot of odd jobs, like a porter uh, in an x-ray department, a chicken shed cleaner, and then he also took time off to hitchhike in Europe. And of course, there's that infamous trip in Austria where, when drunk, he lay in a field in Innsbruck um, with his Hitchhiker's Guide to Europe book in his pocket, and he gazed up at the stars above him, and he thought, someone should write a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy, which he promptly forgot about. One Christmas, he went to his mother's, and um, he was quite depressed, and he ended up staying a year. He describes that year, 1976, as his worst year, but it was also then that he began to write the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. It started off first for radio. Uh, the first episode was broadcast in March 70, 1978, and the print version was published in 1979. Douglas Adams suffered greatly from writer's block, 
and even saw writing as a form of torture. His editors were known to have locked him in a hotel suite for three weeks to ensure deadlines were met. While he didn't love writing, he was interested, passionate, and curious about so many things. He started a dot-com company, he made computer games, he loved music, and owned over 30 left-handed guitars, I assume because he was left-handed. For his 42nd birthday, his friend, David Gilmore from Pink Floyd, invited him on stage to interpret two tracks from The Dark Side of the Moon. He lists the Beatles, or he listed the Beatles and Monty Python as his key cultural influences and felt that he had his own epiphany at the moment when he realized that being funny could be a way that intelligent people could express themselves. He called himself a radical atheist. He used the word radical to make it clear he was not agnostic and was fascinated by religion. In 1993, for part of the Last Chance to See project, he went to Madagascar to find a rare type of lemur. It is still the thing I am most proud of, he said. He moved to Santa Barbara, California in 1999 and died there at the tragically young age of 49 of a heart attack in 2001. And I have watched a few interviews with him and definitely read a lot about him. And I would have loved to have had him over for dinner. He just seems like he was just a charming, hilarious, intelligent, and just really personable man. So that's Douglas Adams. Normally when I do summaries of uh, the novels that we read, the books we read, I just sort of do a paraphrase of it from my own words. But I thought it would be fun to actually read the entry on The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy from the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica online, since much is made of the Encyclopedia Galactica during the novel uh, is a the official source versus The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is the informal but sometimes more helpful source. But then having seen that, I realized that the summary is quite detailed and lengthy. So please sit back and enjoy uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica's take on The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Arthur Dent whose house is about to be demolished for a planned road bypass, is lying down in front of a bulldozer when his friend Ford Prefect arrives and tells him that it is imperative that they go to the pub immediately. There, Ford explains that he is actually from a planet near Beetlejuice and that another alien species, the Vogons, are about to destroy the Earth to make space for a hyperspatial express route. Meanwhile, Zaphoid Beeblebrox, president of the galaxy, and his human female friend, Trillian, steal the Heart of Gold spaceship. Ford and Arthur hitch a ride on a Vogon destructor ship, and Ford lends Arthur the electronic guidebook, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and gives him a babel fish to stick in his ear to translate alien speech. The Vogon ship captain has Ford and Arthur ejected into space, but the Heart of Gold, which has an infinite improbability drive, picks them up 29 seconds later. The drive makes it possible to traverse interstellar space almost instantly, but also causes Ford to briefly turn into a penguin. Zaphoid sends his depressive robot, Marvin, to escort the hitchhikers to the bridge. Later that night, the Heart of Gold reaches its destination, the legendary planet Magrathia, which in the past built planets to order for wealthy customers, but later disappeared. However, Magrathia, after sending a message that it is closed for business, fires missiles at the Heart of Gold. The ship's computer is unable to take evasive action, but Arthur engages the infinite improbability drive, and the missiles turn into a sperm whale and a bowl of petunias. Both fall to the planet's surface. Everything seems fine, except that Trillian's pet mice, Benji and Frankie, escape their cage. On Magrathia, Zaphoid, Trillian, and Ford explore the planet's tunnels, leaving Marvin and Arthur to guard the entrance. Arthur encounters an elderly native of the planet, who introduces himself as Slarta Bartfast, and explains that the populace is not dead, but were sleeping until the economy improved. They are now engaged in building a second Earth, having been commissioned by mice, which are really hyper-intelligent, pan-dimensional beings, to build the first Earth. These beings had built a supercomputer, Deep Thought, to determine the answer to life, the universe, and everything. After a period of 7.5 million years, the computer declared the answer to be 42. The computer designed a more powerful computer, Earth, to find the question to which 42 is the answer. Earth had nearly completed its calculations when the Vogons destroyed it. 
Slart de Bartfast brings Arthur to meet the mice who commissioned the building of Earth, and they prove to be Benji and Frankie. Safoid and Ford suggest that Arthur may have some ideas about the question, as his brain was an organic part of Earth, and Benji and Frankie decide that they will buy Arthur's brain and chop it up to look for their answer. Arthur, Ford, Zaphoid, and Trillian are saved by the arrival of the Galactic Police to arrest Zaphoid for the theft of the Heart of Gold. Marvin depresses the computer running the ship and life systems for the police into committing suicide, and the five travelers all escape to the Heart of Gold, after which they head towards the restaurant at the end of the universe. Awesome. <laughs> it's a very detailed summary. I know. I know. Feel free to edit away, Dennis. Uh, I don't know. I, I, yeah, there it is. Yeah, in case you didn't read it, that's all the the narrative part, um, <laughs> e- except that it's goofier when you actually read the book. <laughs> this is so, this is one time where the summary may actually be longer than the actual discussion of the uh, of, the, of the book. <laughs> oh, I doubt it. <laughs> what are our experiences with this book? I, I know I've read that before. I think Kirsten, it was your first time, right? Oh yes, it was my first time. And you know, I, I I know it's not a it's not a surprise uh, to you guys, um, and maybe to some of our listeners that I mean I'm not a great fan of science fiction. Although that's weird because every time I say that and then we read something that's science fictiony on this podcast, I end up liking it. So I need to check myself. I think. <laughs> so, but yes, it was my it was my first time. I always uh, kind of put the Hitchhiker's Guide in the same chronology as I do with when I discovered Monty Python, because I discovered them both probably within a few months of each other at the perfect age, I think, to discover both things, which is about grade seven or so. And uh, I remember I was babysitting for some kid. (laughs) I didn't do a lot of babysitting, but this one family I did, I I don't know why they kept hiring me, but after I put the kid to sleep, I don't, I don't mean it that way. No, it sounds like a veterinarian. (laughs) Uh, after, uh, after I uh, made sure that the child was sleeping soundly, I sat on the couch and I opened The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I just remember laughing out loud at it, thinking it was the funniest thing I had ever read. And I quickly consumed the whole series. And uh, and it's interesting to hear in your summary uh, or in your biography, Kirsten, that uh, he wrote for Monty Python, because I do always think of the two in very similar ways, lots of overlap and I guess it stands to reason. He has a very similar uh, sense of humor to those uh, Monty Python guys. Yeah, and I guess he uh, he said um, at one point that what he really wanted to be was John Cleese, but that job was already taken. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank goodness he wasn't because I appreciate his contributions to the uh, field as well. I had read, uh, I think I was also in junior high when I first encountered the Hitchhiker's Guide and borrowed them from the library. I ended up buying what at the time was called, uh, it was a four volume set of the first four books, which was called the inaccurately named Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Trilogy. And later on, when the fifth book came out, I also read that one. And they just renamed the trilogy, the increasingly inaccurately named <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide Trilogy. <laughs> I've also played the uh, Infocom computer game that was based on it. There was a TV series the BBC did, which I'd seen many years ago on VHS. There was a 2005 movie, which I watched, which is widely reviled. But, uh, (laughs) you know, I kind of like parts of it. And, uh, of course, it all started with the BBC radio series. And I actually own a cassette version of the BBC radio series. Oh, so wonderful. this is something that has been kind of intertwined with my life for decades now. <laughs> I love this series. Once I started reading it, I, I think I was really shocked to see how many references are in there that have become part of our culture. And uh, like, I did not realize that Babel Fish came from this book, like the Babel <laughs> Fish yeah. translation online computer um, uh, service. It comes from this book or the whole don't panic because seriously, don't panic has been something that I've lived by for <laughs> many, many years. And because I'm also German, I always say kind of panic. But I didn't realize that, well, I mean, of course, it comes from other places, too. But really, it does come from from this book. And on this weekend, my son actually just gave me a stick and poke that says, kind of panic. 
<laughs> on my arm. So um, I've now taken, uh, you know, these pop cultural references from this book and uh, m- made them uh, really my own and without even realizing it. So um, maybe, maybe we can get a, a close up picture of that for our uh, website uh, I sure- for the notes. I sure will because um, also it's uh, it's intertwined with another stick and poke that Isaac gave me of the interobang, which was one of my nerd words from a previous podcast. So I'll take a picture. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, but I, I was surprised at how much I got into the book right away. Like it really pulls you in immediately. The writing is really funny. And I think after the earth blows up, then I kind of, I think I lost, not not that I lost interest, but I was like, okay, yeah, spaceship, blah, blah, blah. You know, that was like be- becoming sort of more of science fiction-y stuff. And then they introduced the, Marvin was introduced and I was like, oh my mm-hmm. gosh, I love this, this depressed uh, robot. I just could not get enough of Marvin. <laughs> Well, it's funny because, you know, Des mentions the problematic aspect of the 2005 movie. But one of the things that I think the movie gets absolutely right is Marvin, the paranoid android, is voiced by Alan Rickman. And so if you can just imagine Alan Rickman's voice, just his fabulous resonant voice. Uh, coming out of that goofy little robot, it's uh, it's it's perfect. I can't read Marvin's lines without hearing Alan Rickman's voice now. So. Marvin apparently was originally written as kind of a one-shot gag character for the radio show, but listeners enjoyed him, so he kept coming back. And uh, throughout the series, you always interact with Marvin, uh-huh. and right up until the end. Those diodes in the left side of his body are still never been repaired, and they're still causing him trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, it's interesting too. Like I, I know we'll uh, talk about this a bit. Is that you know the humor is the vehicle for the story, but it also is a way for Douglas Adams to introduce a lot of his own philosophical ideas or just ideas about the world and life or life, the universe and everything, if you want. And, and with Marvin, he really represents the philosophy of nihilism, the, the idea that there's no meaning to existence and any attempt to construct one is pointless, irrational, and he's just constantly depressed. And I feel like if you had to push Douglas Adams he probably doesn't agree all the time with, with Marvin. He takes more of an absurdist approach, which is sort of like, he'll agree that life has no meaning, but then that that's okay, that you can still make your own meaning and stuff. And so you get that sense of other characters too, that uh, they all agree that there's no meaning or the meaning is unknowable. But uh, poor Marvin, all he does is get himself and the people around him depressed, whereas the other characters do carve out a sort of a life. And it goes on in the other books too, develops that idea a bit more. And I was reading this book on an iPad uh, and I found, I'm going to refer to this as a gray market PDF. Um, it was not through our overdrive, uh, and, but it wasn't something like BitTorrent. I just Googled uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy PDF. And it's amazing what you can find. And it was all, I don't even know how many books there are now, five or six. And I just kept reading. Like it just kind of, uh, it just keeps flowing. I didn't get through the whole series, but I just, I feel like uh, the whole series has to be really, if you enjoy the first one, you should just keep going. Yeah, definitely. The first four in the series are uh, the strongest ones. I think Douglas Adams himself said his favorite was the restaurant at the end of the universe. He thought it was the most cohesive and, and just his favorite overall. But yeah, if you like the first one, you just keep going because it's worthwhile. I I came across a copy of The Ultimate Hitchhiker's Guide, which is the first five books. There was a sixth book written after Douglas Adams' death, which I've never read because it wasn't written by him. But he he mentioned there a story about how when he was hitchhiking in Europe, he was in this one town and he was – he couldn't find his hotel. Eventually wandering around the streets, he spotted someone and he went over and tried to talk to them and get directions. But not only did the person not speak English, they didn't actually speak at all. They were mute deaf. And so he kind of apologized and stumbled away and eventually he found another person. And to his dismay, this person was also a deaf mute and he couldn't communicate. And so he wandered off again and he found a third person and this person was also deaf mute and he was starting to think he was in a Kafka novel until he turned a corner and there was a hotel and there was a convention for people who were deaf mute. And and this, uh, you know, you can kind of see that influence in his work too where things just don't seem to make sense around us. It's hard to comprehend the world because it's so complicated. 
but sometimes there's an explanation and it's just around the corner and it does mm -hmm. make sense. But without knowing it, we're left in this kind of constant dismay about a world that's a little hard to come to grips with. And the characters in the novel are, con especially Arthur Dent, who is our, you know, human surrogate for this wild and unpredictable universe, is constantly being thrown out of balance by things coming his way that just don't make any sense within his frame of view. One of the basic elements of The Hitchhiker's Guide is it's driven by the search for the meaning of life. So one of the questions we asked our readers was, uh, what big questions would you like the answer to? And I know on our um, our Facebook page, Regan wrote that she does the galaxy really go on forever? Is the one of the questions that she would like an answer to? Oh, boy, mm. I, I, well, you're in luck, Regan, because we have that actual answer today on the podcast. Uh, Kirsten, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> the answer is forty-two. <laughs> <laughs> so, somebody actually on our Instagram posts of the questions just kept putting 42, 42, 42, 42. That's a good question, Regan. I would say infinite. For me, the biggest question in life is how can we be happy? Mm -hmm. Which is a question that uh, for the longest time, no one really looked at very Closely, I mean, philosophers kind of deal with it in various ways, but uh, in recent decades, there has been research, like scientific research, where they investigate how people can be happy. And the one thing that's really clear from all the stuff that I read is that humans are terrible at figuring out what makes them happy. <laughs> and we often do things that ultimately do not make us happy, but we think they will make us happy. So, Yeah. But that's my big question is how can we be happy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of a, a book I read a while ago called The Geography of Bliss. And it was a travel log, nonfiction book. And the author traveled around uh, the world to different places in the world that scored very high on this sort of happiness index that was based on a bunch of factors put out by the United Nations and UNICEF and tried to figure out what made these places on Earth the happiest places on Earth. And they weren't places you would necessarily think of. Like, I think Finland was one of the countries. And it was quite an interesting uh, book to just to uh, just throwing it out there. That's not my, uh, tell us about another book, but I just thought I'd just mention that. Uh, I've just written it down. It sounds really good. <laughs> Geography of Bliss. Mm -hmm. A different type of guide. Mm -hmm. exactly. yes. The guide was also meant to be a useful source of knowledge, but it's clearly heavily opinionated and frequently out of date. Do you guys have a go-to source when you're looking for accurate information? Well, I personally like to always check the Winnipeg Public Library uh, uh, spot, spotting fake news info guide, which is always up to date and always has the most uh, accurate information. I don't know about you guys, but I find the Winnipeg Public Library info guide on disinformation and spotting fake news. <laughs> Really, all of the info guides are are all, very All of them strong. are good, but really only one of them is great. And that would be the <laughs> what they call library info guide on media literacy. Okay. And who, my who thing authors is. that guide? Oh, you know, uh, let me just look Trevor? it up here. Let me just check. Oh, um, oh, 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 gosh, I do. <laughs> oh, I'm embarrassed okay. now. I'm embarrassed. Boy, is my face red. Yeah. <laughs> I have to admit, I often go to Wikipedia when I'm looking for information, at least as a kind of an overview. It's not a definitive source because it is user editable, editable and sometimes it's just wrong. But uh, often it's a very useful kind of way to glance at things and they list sources at the bottom. So if you're really trying to dig into it, look at the sources that Wikipedia articles have as a starting point for your research. Yeah, I was going to say Wikipedia as well, just as a starting point. And also just that sometimes you need to spend time you can't just put your questions into Google and then expect the first answer to be the correct one. You do have to spend some time. And I think what Douglas Adams also talks about in his book is um, and sort of criticizes is our lack of critical thinking that we do need to work at it to find the answers. And so you use Wikipedia, but then you go from there and you explore the references that they provide. But then you also then start to do some of your own research as well, because I mean, that just does take time and we have to think for ourselves as well and not just accept without thinking how things are how things should be i should add to if you want a source that has as much authority as the hitchhiker's guide i found urban dictionary to be very useful <laughs> for finding definitions of words that have kind of the spirit of 
of the guide. <laughs> uh, but also useful because it's it's frequently not the stuff you find in Merriam-Webster or, uh, you know, another traditional dictionary source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep you up to date with the ute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially for, you know, a middle-aged person like myself who's not up on all the hip terms. Um, it, it's good to mm -hmm. get a bit of that. Exactly. I, I like to uh, impress the young people, uh, <laughs> you know, that I come in contact with. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. um, Kristen mentioned before, like how many elements of the Hitchhiker's Guide have made it into popular culture. One of the phrases that comes up in the guide is uh, knowing where your towel is, uh, which at the beginning, you know, they kind of explain it's a hitchhiker shorthand for being ready for what lies ahead. If you have your towel, then your people are likely to assume you have all the other stuff that you'd normally have with you and will happily lend you those things if you don't happen to have them with you, because at least you've got your towel. What do you need to feel like you're ready to face what's ahead of you? Well, as uh, friends of this podcast may know, in the in the last couple of years, I've uh, gotten into uh, time pieces. <laughs> and so I feel like I rarely go anywhere without wearing one of my watches. And my daughter says, you can't get any more watches until you get rid of some of yours. So mm. um, this one I acquired, I'm holding up to the screen, uh, my newest acquisition, a Seiko 38 millimeter Alpinist, no compass. Uh, it's, it's sort of become my go-to watch. And I just feel good about putting it on in the morning. When I put my wristwatch on in the morning, I feel like I'm ready for the day. I'm set, and uh, it's become sort of my security blanket, for, uh, in a way. Whether it's this particular one or any of the ones that, I, that I've acquired recently. And it looks snazzy. Thank snazzy. you very much. Yes. Yeah. Trillion underscore two, it, mm -hmm. Trillion, commented on uh, our Instagram post about this and said, my lipstick, with a happy face. Hmm. hmm. But sure. Yeah. That might prepare you to face whatever the universe brings your way. <laughs> My mother would probably agree. She was always telling me, for God's sake, Kirsten, put on some lipstick. <laughs> oh, Sharon. <laughs> yeah. For for me, if I have my cell phone, my wallet, my bus pass, and my house keys, I feel like I can go anywhere mm. and I'll be okay. Like I've got everything that covers like 90% of what I have to do in any given situation. It's kind of the, the practical answer as opposed to something a little more comforting. If I'm looking for comfort, I often carry a whistle with me, which I've never needed to use, <laughs> but it's just kind of neat to have around. Hmm. Is that just for safety slash comfort? I don't know. I just think that they're neat. <laughs> okay. I like it. <laughs> yeah. The only downside to carrying a whistle is that you want to blow a whistle, and there's very few situations where it's appropriate <laughs> to blow a whistle. So the whole time you've got it with you, you've got to resist the urge <laughs> to just blow that whistle. Yeah. The only thing I could think is be if, say, if you were up for a walk and you came across a uh, – a high school football game uh, and the referee there didn't show up and they're and the both teams are just kind of standing around and you're like it's okay guys i got a whistle uh so we can play yeah that would take care of that there's actually a whole subculture that you can find online of everyday carry enthusiasts where people share what they carry with them every day so that they're prepared and uh some people are very intense about their edc as they say everyday carry but usually people do not list towels. It's interesting. I actually read an interview with Douglas Adams where he was – either that or it was an intro to one of his books where he was saying the whole towel thing came about because when he was on vacation with his friends, he was constantly forgetting stuff, including his towel. And his friends would get so annoyed with him that he didn't have a towel with him that he figured – when he wrote the guy that, you know, if he had had his towel, maybe they would have assumed he had all his other stuff and they would have been a lot less annoyed with him. <laughs> a lot of the jokes in Hitchhiker's Guide are actually inside jokes. Like the whole discussion about Vogon poetry where they're talking about how it's the third worst in the universe. The first worst in the universe uh, in the original radio play was the name of a friend of Douglas Adams who wrote poetry and worked <laughs> with him on other projects. And so he just tossed it in. For the book, they changed the name slightly, but that's the, you know, a lot of these references are just people he knows or things he's done himself, and he just tosses it into the book. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many great stories about the writing of the book and the mythology around the series, and one that 
you touched on, Kirsten, in your intro was Douglas Adams' love-hate relationship with writing mm -hmm. and deadlines. And he has that quotation about how he loves deadlines. He loves the sound they make when they swoosh by. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I, there's a great story about he was behind the deadline for the first novel, and the publishers were getting uh, fed up with him. And they said, we need the book. And he's like, oh, you know, it'll be here. And he's like, no, we're sending a courier over today. Just finish the page that you're on. Yeah. And so that's why the novel ends so suddenly, where it's like, and then they go to the, to the uh, hotel or the uh, restaurant at the end of the universe, because that was literally the page he was working on. And he <laughs> had to send that off, and that became the first book. So, I mean, it's just le <laughs> legendary. I appreciate the fact that a person can feel tortured by writing and have such trouble keeping deadlines and yet still produce such marvelous work. Mm -hmm. It never feels tortured. It always feels breezy and uh, easy to read. Yeah, and I think it sounds like it really kept him also kind of, I don't know, humble or really real because he found it hard. He found it difficult. It was difficult work. And I think sometimes with funny things, we tend to think, oh, that's just a funny person. And it just sort of spills out onto the page. And um, and it was hard for him. And I so I think he was a humble guy and, and insecure, too, about his writing. I think that comes through then in his curiosity for so much in the world that I think he just really understands how much effort and time it takes to do so many different things. And uh, yeah, I think that that kind of comes through as well. Yeah, I liked I liked reading about him and hearing about him. He just seemed like such a cool guy. And I feel like I just discovered him in the last <laughs> couple weeks, which seems silly. I'd never heard of the towel reference before. And now there's like a towel day, May 25th. And I think 2021 is going to be the 20th anniversary of this world, you know, annual t towel day. So I just feel like there were so many references just that have passed me by for decades, obviously. <laughs> and now you're going to see them every day. <laughs> <Yeah>. Probably. Probably. <laughs> And the other thing that struck me about learning more about Douglas Adams this past month was that he was interested, yes, he's known for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but he was interested in so many other things and science yeah. and art and music. And he did all of this body of work and he still died at 49. Like I it just, know. it seemed like he lived an entire lifetime's length of life in a very short period, which always mm -hmm. kind of strikes me when you hear these people that die before their time. It always gives you a kind of a, something to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things about the book is it is a, a humorous book. It's a comedy. It's farcical. It's absurd. But it does look at big questions just in a very silly way. Do we think that humor is a good way to look at big moral and serious questions about life? I think so, because I was also thinking about another writer that I really enjoy, who is also uses humor to sort of talk about big issues, and that's David Sedaris, where it's really laugh out loud funny, and yet he's often talking about family tragedy and depression and sort of more of those sort of big personal issues while Douglas Adams is kind of looking at kind of bigger sort of philosophical questions. And I think think also too short, like Doug, uh, David Sedaris also writes very sort of just short essays and shorter stories. I think it works. I think it works for me, definitely. And then allows you to maybe then explore deeper with other sources, I guess. Yeah. I was just going to say, I was also wondering too about, is there a difference between sort of like British humor? Like, because he is British and the Monty Python kind of style of humor, you know, he really loved John Cleese. Like, is there a difference in that? But it seems to me that his humor caught on worldwide and right away too. It resonated. Well, an interesting point that actually comes out of the Britishness is there are a lot of jokes in the book and the radio series and such that non-British readers and listeners probably missed the first time. Like Ford Prefect, they talk about how, you know, Ford, when he came to Earth, thought that was a perfectly ordinary name. And uh, when I first read it, and for the longest time, I didn't know why it was particularly weird. And that's because in Britain, the Ford Prefect was a model of car. So essentially, the character named himself, like in North America, it might be like Ford Focus or Hyundai Pony or something like that. And so the name is a little sillier because you know it's the name of a car, but the prefect was not sold in North America. Uh. <laughs> so a lot of us missed that joke. They actually did a nice little turn in the movie where uh, Ford, his first encounter with Arthur is Ford is trying to introduce himself to what he thinks is the dominant life form on Earth. 
So he's standing in the middle of the road as a car is rushing towards him and Arthur saves his life, which is why Ford later saves Arthur's life when the planet is going to be destroyed. So it's a nice little tie in. Sorry, I didn't leave you room to answer the question yourself, Trevor. Oh, no, I was just I was thinking that, yeah, for myself, I, I enjoy people with a sense of humor and authors with a sense of humor. So for me, it totally works. If something's funny, I'll be more inclined to keep reading. And so it's a little bit like that analogy of trying to hide cauliflower in the mac and cheese. Like, I feel like if it's something's funny and enjoyable, I'll read it. And if I happen, if someone actually slips a little philosophy in there, then uh, then I'll, I'll absorb it through the humor. So yeah, it's a very effective method for me to learn about things. And it uh, doesn't feel like you're learning at all, does it? It feels like you're just being entertained. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually one of my favorite things about TV series. I just finished watching The Good Place, mm -hmm. uh, which I was streaming on Netflix. It's a comedy built around moral philosophy, which does not sound like a natural match, but they made it hilarious but educational at the same time. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> I've heard it said, and it's a common phrase, that laughing and crying are the things we do when we don't know what else to do. Sometimes these big questions... You feel like crying, but sometimes if you can laugh about them, it helps to process them still and move forward, but still have a sense of gaining a little bit of control or understanding about the world around us. It takes us back oh, to yeah. it takes us back to that nihilism versus absurdism. Nihilism is crying, absurdism is laughing, and I'd I'd rather be laughing. Also, I think that was something Slur de Bartfast said at the end where, you know, it's like uh it's way too complicated to make sense of the world, so hang the meaning and just try to keep yourself occupied. Uh, I'd rather be happy than mm -hmm. to know everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, of course, he's asked, oh, are you happy? Well, no. And that's where it all falls down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, him him and his fjords. Hey. He yeah, just, he's so he got a lot of, of work, work fulfillment out of his fjords. But, and then uh, <laughs> he, was assigned to, he was assigned to doing Africa yeah. in the new one. He was sticking all kinds of fjords in there because he just loved them so much. And, oh, yeah. yeah. So before we wrap up our discussion, uh, anybody have any last thoughts on the book? I liked all the musical references, too. I was just sort of noticing that, like, okay, Heart of Gold, the Heart of Gold ship. <laughs> I don't know if that is actually a musical reference, but also to the, uh, the, the, when they were trying to figure out, like right near the end of the first book about um, what question to ask people to be able to get the answer, which is 42. How many roads must a man walk down? <laughs> and then, and Eddie, the computer. Okay. That was another really hilarious part too, where he just starts singing. You'll never <laughs> walk alone. And he just, <laughs> Just the way it's written, you can just hear it, and it's hilarious. It's it's so so funny, and that I had to then go and listen to it. And there's a really good Mumford and Sons version of uh, "You'll Never Walk Alone." So I so I enjoyed the musical references. Yeah, I just I would recommend this series to anyone that enjoys humorous stories that uh, is looking for something to take their mind off of everything that's going on in the world right now. It's a, it's a classic for a reason because uh, it's well written and yeah, if you enjoy it, there's probably about 6,000 pages more you could read to depending on how, <laughs> how long the series keeps going. I don't know. So yes, uh, <laughs> not, nothing more to add except don't panic everyone. Don't mm -hmm. panic. Yeah. Kind of panic. <laughs> And and if you do like it, he's uh, the other stuff Douglas Adams has written, like particularly the Dirk Gently Holistic Detective Agency series, which I think was only two books, but um, it's also good. And the Netflix series based on Dirk Gently, which is only based on it because it's not actually based on any of the books directly, is also really hilarious and worth watching. So is that also like a science fiction-y series, the Dirk Gently? Um, in the sense that it's, yeah, yeah, it would be okay. in the sense that it's an absurdist universe where all sorts of strange things happen that sometimes involve aliens or time travel oh, okay. or combinations thereof, but it all takes place on earth. Right. Okay. Yeah. Writing that down too. <laughs> so we'll move on. And normally we do something called, can you tell me a book I would also like, but as by the time you listen to this, 2020 will have passed into the history books and 2021 will just be kicking off. So instead of our usual book recommendations, we thought we'd talk a little bit about our reading goals for this new year. The last year when we did this, I said I wanted to read Consider Phlebas by Ian Banks, the first book in the culture series of sci-fi novels. And I did read it, as well as the second book, uh, Player of Games, and I'm very happy I did because they're excellent. 
consider Flebus as a rip-roaring space opera adventure on a grand scale with lots of thoughtful bits squeezed in between invigorating action sequences. And I highly recommend it. Uh, for this year's goals, I was thinking of looking for a different twist on a favorite genre. I've mentioned in the past that cozy mysteries are my favorite comfort reads. I like the formula of the plucky but unqualified sleuth who figures out who done it when the police get it wrong, and I love all the cutesy puns and gags that usually go with that. I've been trying to broaden my reading horizons over the past few years, and I thought it would be fun to apply this to my comfort genre, too. So my goal this year is to read some cozy mysteries that feature more diverse protagonists and perspectives and that come from a broader range of authors. Specifically, I'm hoping to find cozies written by or featuring characters that are not all white, Christian, cisgendered, heterosexual, neurotypical, middle-class people, <laughs> like all of the ones that I've read so far, except for the number one ladies detective agency, I guess, uh, have been. So I've started searching around a bit using Novelist and Google, and I found a few that look promising, but I'm also open to suggestions. So if you have a favorite or three, send an email to wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca and let me know. Well, uh, looking back to last year, which feels more like 10 years ago, doesn't it? Uh, my <laughs> two reading goals, uh, one was The Splendid in the Vile by Eric Larson. I wasn't sure if I would have time to read this at the time because it's over 600 pages long. But guess what? COVID happened and I had lots of time to read. And the book actually came in for me, I think, the first week of March. So right before the, the first big shutdown, I was able to get it. And it was just to remind readers, it was an in-depth look at 12 months of Winston Churchill's life from uh, the day that he becomes prime minister to the day that the uh, the major part of the Battle of Britain or the Blitz ends. And it's, it was an excellent read. I recommend it to anyone. And the only downside was that it sent me down a, a deep dive into reading about other things about Winston Churchill and World War II over the summer, uh, which is not a bad thing, but it kind of got me off on a tangent. The other book I was not quite as successful with was uh, I made the, uh, the the bold statement that I would read a Carol Shields novel in 2020. <laughs> uh, and I did pick up so Unless. So bold. Uh, <laughs> unless by Carol Shields. Carol Shields, our uh, patron saint, the namesake of our normal recording room. I have to say, though, I read a little bit of Unless. And uh, I think this is an example of when maybe a book isn't a bad book, but it's just a bad book at the time for the person because I read the first couple of chapters and I was like, oh, I do not want to read about this lady in her forties and her relationship with her daughter and uh, the whole writing process. And I just, Oh, I, I know it's good. And I know Carol Shields was, is a, is a civic treasure and, 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 and beloved by millions. And I will, I will, my, one of my goals in 2021 is I will pick this book up again and I will approach it with um, an open mind uh, so I did not do quite as well with that one. Um, but also looking forward to 2021. I have a couple books that I'm interested in reading. One is a biography of Mike Nichols that will be out in February. Uh, Mike Nichols, you may remember his name as a movie director directing classics like The Graduate, but more recent ones, my personal favorite, Working Girl and, um, the Birdcage. He also was part of a comedy duo, Nichols and May, with Elaine May in the 50s before he got into movies. It just sounds like a very interesting read. It's also 600 plus pages. And I'm not wishing another lockdown on us in 2021, but uh, hopefully I can get through that one. And I thought I'd just quickly mention two books by friends or podcast uh, authors that we've read in the past. So Kazuro Ishiguro has a new book coming out. We read The Remains of the Day a year or so ago, and his new book is called Clara and the Sun. Uh, let me just read this quick description. From the Nobel laureate and master of the hyperreal comes a gorgeously written novel that poses a question as old as Greek myths. What does it mean to be human? Clara, an artificial friend, smiles and nods to customers in manager's store while tracking each day by the sun's arc. When a mother and daughter adopt Clara, a Pandora's box of repressed emotion springs open, fleshing out Ishiguro's themes of resilience and vulnerability in our mad, 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 mad world. So mm. couldn't, couldn't be more different than Remains of the Day in terms of uh, subject, but I'm, I'm sure it's a great read. And just the other one I want to mention is by another author we've read, Jhumpa Lahiri, who wrote The Namesake. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we read it, we learned that she had moved to Italy and taught herself Italian. Well, this next book, she's written, it's called Whereabouts. She wrote the entire thing in Italian. 
and translate it back into English uh, <laughs> herself. <laughs> so,、Amazing. I mean, just that alone, I think, would be worth、uh, a look. And it's called Whereabouts.、Mm-hmm. So, those are my reading goals for 2021.、Nice. You're right. I am intrigued by your suggestions, as you thought yeah, that well, I would be. Yes. I thought yes, you would like,、yes. uh, you know, I thought you would. I thought you would, Kirsten. <laughs> Yes, so my recommendations from a year ago, or my hopes to read from a year ago, was Sherry de Malin's Empire of Wild. And I think what I said was, I'm looking forward to reading this book because it has sexy parts. I don't think that was the only reason why I was wanting to read it. That's、And、the I only did- part I remember. <laughs> I did read it. Shari de Melin, of course, wrote The Marrow Thieves, which I loved. And I loved Empire of Wild. Yes, it was, you know, there were some sexy parts, very sort of sensuous. But it, How sexy were they? Well, this is a family program, so. Well, we'll say that for the、uh, platinum members. <laughs> That's right, right. For, <laughs>、um, so th- this story was inspired by the Metis story of the Rokaru, a werewolf like creature. It's, it's about this woman named Joan who's been searching for her long lost love, her husband, Victor,、uh, and she's been searching for over a year. She finds him in a revival tent,、uh, but he insists that he is the Reverend Wolf. A charismatic preacher. And so she's trying to sort of get him back. It's a very personal and mythic sort of monster story. Anyway, very, very good. She's such a great writer. The second book that I had on my list was the Emily St. Mandel,、uh, The Glass Hotel, which I haven't read yet, but because I'm still on the holds list, I think, for it. So I haven't received it yet. So, but I will read it,、um, hopefully over the, the Christmas break. For 2021, what I am looking forward to reading, actually, one of them I have already On my to be read book pile. This is called Nu Pi Ming, The Cure for White Ladies by Leanne Betasamosake Simpson. Leanne Simpson. And it is about the seven characters an old man, a maple tree, an old woman, a giant, a caribou, a human, a two humans.、Um, and each of them attempts to commune with the unnatural urban settler world and each searches out the natural world. World, only to discover those pockets that still exist are owned, contained, counted, and consumed. So it looks like it's just written very, very interestingly and very uniquely. Like some pages just have what looks like a poem on there or just a couple of words or some paragraphs. So I'm very eager to start reading that. And one more book that's on my to be read reading list for 2021 is More Than a Woman by Catelyn Moran. And I just really started reading her and listening to her. She's a British author and columnist who is very funny, but also is a great observer of the world around her. And,、uh, I feel like I was just really, really introduced to her,、uh, in the last little while while listening to podcasts as I was walking to work. And,、uh, this More Than a Woman, Is her latest book. It's about sort of sex and big bums and、uh, middle age. And so I'm looking forward to reading that because I, I don't know, I guess I always need to have some sex in my books to look forward to. So there we go.、Uh, just, yeah, and I, you know, keep, keeping it real. Those are my two choices. <laughs> Excellent.、Mm-hmm. So now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, in which our hosts expose a word or phrase to undue levels of scrutiny and investigation. Oh. Who would like to go first? Oh.、Uh, well, you know what? I might as well just go. Mine's kind of topical and possibly hopeful. My word is strain. Oh. Now, at the point of this recording, there's a lot of talk about a new strain of COVID that's been discovered in England and the uncertainty around that. You know, what, what does it mean? Uh, uh, will the vaccines work on it? There's a lot of unanswered questions. And so there's too many definitions for strain. I turn to our old friend Miriam Webster. The one that applies to that kind of strain,、uh, I think, is this first one. It's a noun. A group of presumed common ancestry with a clear cut physiological, but usually not morphological distinctions. For example, a strain of winter wheat or a strain of a virus. But the other type of strain that I'd like to talk about is the verb strain, which is to exert oneself or one's senses to the utmost. 
And I think this past year has certainly been a strain on many of us, on our, uh, our personal lives, on our systems, on our leaders. And, uh, so the two versions of strain have been on my mind recently. And I think to sum up 2020, perhaps that's an appropriate word. But I also, before passing the baton, as it were, to one of you, I'd like to mention a throwback to a nerd word way back in February. It was the last time we recorded a normal episode when we did the break. And my nerd word was Pantone. You might remember it, it's a mysterious organization that decides on colors of the year. And this year, this is the hopeful part, for the first time ever, they have chosen two colors to represent 2021. And so the two colors are Ultimate Gray, Pantene 17-5104, and Illuminating, uh, Pantone 13-0647, which is a very bright yellow. And what they say is those are two independent colors that highlight how different elements come together to support one another. They think that that best expresses the mood for Pantone Color of the Year 2021, practical and rock solid, but at the same time warming and optimistic. The union of Pantone 17-5401, Ultimate Gray, and Pantone 13-0647, Illuminating, is one of strength and positivity. It is a story of color that encapsulates deeper feelings of thoughtfulness with the promise of something sunny and friendly. So So here's to 2021 being illuminating and ultimate gray, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Hopeful. Mm-hmm. I was talking uh, with our, our dear friend who we miss, Erica. I was uh, telling her about some of our, our family Advent celebrations, which are very odd this year. Uh, I get together with my family at, over Zoom and we sing carols at Advent and we drink Louvine. And uh, it's just a, quite hilarious. But I said to Erica, I said, it warms the cockles of my heart. And uh, she said, hey, hey cockles. And I was like, yeah, what is that word? Cockles. So I did do a bit of a deep dive about the word cockles. And Oxford English Dictionary describes cockles as an edible burrowing bivalve mollus with a strong ribbed shell. But the OED also says this, Cockles is used in connection with to rejoice and to delight. And this is probably due to the likeness of the heart to a cockle shell. But also the zoological name for cockle is cardium from the Greek meaning heart. And the first known reference comes actually from 1671 when John Eshard wrote, As much rejoice the cockles of his heart as he fanfies the what I writ sometimes did much tickle my spleen. <laughs> Which is another <laughs> great term. Um, now, this phrase, using the word cockles, has been thought to be actually an, an anatomical reference to blood transfusions, which at the time were becoming uh, a routine medical procedure. But Webster's new 20th century dictionary, however, says the cockles of one heart means the deepest part of one's heart or emotions. So that fits perfectly with the idea of warming up with love and glue vine and family sing songs. And so I wish everyone some cockle heart warmth and what the heck, maybe a tickled spleen as well. (laughs) Cockles. (laughs) Nice. So I wasn't sure what word to pick this month. So I arbitrarily chose the word arbitrary. (sighs) There are a few related meanings, but I'm focusing on meaning 1B from Merriam-Webster based on or determined by individual preference or convenience rather than by necessity or the intrinsic nature of something. Arbitrary comes from the Latin word arbiter, which means judge, and when first came into use in English, it meant depending on choice or discretion, specifically the expert determination of a judge. But now it's really used to mean anything that comes down to personal choice. Arbitrary is often used in a negative sense, like when laws are enforced in an arbitrary manner. If a supervisor writes you up at work even though you followed company policy, it feels arbitrary. In these cases, the arbitrary nature of things goes against our desire for the world to be predictable and understandable, 
it's harder to navigate life when events occur that go against our understanding of the rules. But arbitrary also gives us opportunities for freedom and self-expression. There are many decisions we face that don't have intrinsic requirements that push a particular choice, so we can exercise our own discretion and arbitrarily choose something we like or just pick something on a whim. There are very few instances where the color of your socks matter, for instance. It's an arbitrary choice, so pick something that makes you slightly happier or slightly less unhappy. Embrace the arbitrary and have fun with it. Oh, love it. That's great. That's, yeah, 2021, embrace the arbitrary. Ah, <laughs> and yes. tickle your spleen. <laughs> and, and as a side note, uh, when people people have often searched for the meaning of 42 mm -hmm. that Douglas Adams picked, and uh, according to him, he was just sitting there thinking he had to have a number, it had to be kind of common, didn't really matter what it was. So after th sitting there for a while, he said... 42 will do. Very There's awesome. the deep meaning. Very good. <laughs> Love it. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have this month. Thank you so much for joining us, dear readers. For January, we're reading V by Kim Thuy. Uh, that's V spelled V-I, and Thuy is T-H-U-Y, and I've probably mispronounced both. It's the One E-Read Canada book selection for January 2021, so there will be lots of discussions and events surrounding it besides our little virtual book club. Winnipeg Public Library is offering unlimited e-book and e-audiobook access to this title for the month of January, so you can download and read or listen with no wait lists. Plus, we have physical copies in our collections too. Call your nearest open branch if you want to get one of those. If you want to tell us what you think we should read next, connect with us on social media or through email. You can find all our contact info at the bottom of the page at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. You can also find all of our past episodes and discussion questions there, too. If you haven't already, subscribe to Time to Read on your favorite podcasting service and maybe leave us a review. Tell your book-loving friends about us, too. And until next time, make sure you find Time, time to Read! furnace is running so i've got background noise oh yeah and i'm by my window so there's background noise there i told isaac to zip it so there shouldn't be any background noise from him we only want front ground noise that's right yeah 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 there's a comfort to it so i would say this sorry uh, let's, no. let's hang on a sec i can't turn this off no that's okay sorry no problem I was just going on and on about my wristwatch anyway. It's probably <laughs> too long. Uh, yeah. That was good. Uh, <sighs> sorry, it's the only place in the house I can have this phone.